<clears throat> Good evening, Crime Talk aficionados. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. Thanks for joining us. Yes, we're live, so that means it is Tuesday night. We go live just about every Tuesday night, 6 p.m. Mountain Time, to talk about really kind of whatever is uh, not only on my mind, but your mind as well. Uh, we will be checking the comments and seeing what uh, is of interest to you all this evening. A couple of things that are interesting to me that I'd like to talk to you about. Obviously, we have the start, finally, of the Chad Daybell trial. And uh, it's taken a long time, a lot of delays. And yes, it is finally going to start tomorrow, 830 Opening statements, and guess what? That's right. We are going to bring it to you live, gavel to gavel coverage. I have a, an appointment first thing in the morning, but I will do everything I can to listen until I get back here and um, see how things get going. Because yes, what happens right after opening statements? The prosecution will call their first witness. Now, I think we all know by now that uh, Lori Vallow will not be joining anybody. Simply not going to happen. She still has Fifth Amendment issues because her case is up on appeal. She has Fifth Amendment issues because her case is uh, pending down in uh, Maricopa County, down in Arizona. So she won't be joining us. And as Mr. Pryor, Mr. John Pryor, the attorney for Chad Day Bell, has alluded to he in his voir dire, he used an example, something to the effect of um, sometimes those little baubles, little bright, shiny things aren't always what you think they are. Hmm. I wonder who he could be referring to. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Lori Vallow, right? I, you could go back since this case has been pending. And I think I have predicted what the defense will be is that uh, here you have poor, sad, sap, Chad Daybell, you know, kids are older, wife's there, he's off doing kind of his thing, and then all of a sudden he meets Lori Vallow, and let's face it, she rocks his world, and this guy's going to do, like, I mean, this beautiful woman is... Uh, you know, paying attention to him. I mean, look at the sad little pathetic man. He always sits there, just sits there in court. Oh, my goodness. Just sad and pathetic. And then, you know, uh, this attractive woman, attractive woman in his eyes, uh, Lori Vallow starts paying attention to him. And guess what? He will do anything to be with her. Now, of course, he's going to come. He is going to claim complete ignorance of what was going on. And I guarantee you that the attorney will do all that he can to make Chad Daybell <clears throat> look like some little sad sack off in his own little world, um, thinking about doomsday stuff. And he's living in this little fairy tale. He's not really paying attention much going on around her other than this Lori Vallow chick keeps following him around and moving next door. And wow, this is great. And, you know, yeah, it's really sad. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see if he, Chad Daybell, ultimately takes the witness stand in his own case. You know, one thing about this case, and you have to give Mr. Pryor some credit for it, you know, oftentimes, uh, when somebody's charged in a homicide case, they just want to get, when everybody goes to jail, they want to get out of jail, get me out of jail, get me out of jail. I mean, I think they, you know, he knew it was, it was not going to be uh, a bond was set. But remember early on, Lori Vallow wanted their bond set to get her out, yada, yada. And uh, he didn't. And there wasn't a whole lot of doing it. He just kind of, you know, he shows up, he shows up with his little white shirt for every court appearance. And, um, you know, just kind of sits there, does whatever he's supposed to do. Who knows what the financial arrangement really is between Chad DeBell, Chad DeBell's family, and Mr. Pryor. Mr. Pryor says it's not about the money, so I don't know if he's independently wealthy there or not. 
but I don't know about you. I don't know if I could go years without, you know, working basically full time and not getting paid. I mean, you know, we could do it for a little while, I guess, but, uh, you know, and, um, Mr. Pryor, uh, I, I've warned you. I know we've never met, but never, ever, ever, ever do a case pro bono. It is the biggest pain in the butt that you could possibly imagine. You are held to the same standard. And guess what? If you're going to do a pro bono, well, you may have to dip into your own pocket to do what a reasonable, competent attorney would do. and pay for experts. Okay. Let me give you an example. I did one myself years and years ago. I don't think I've ever told, maybe I did tell the story, but I remember I was home in bed, you know, watching the 10 o'clock news. And all of a sudden there's a picture of my client. I'm like, Hey, I know that guy. He's my client. And he is accused of doing some really bad things, uh, to a woman. Uh, that lived in this like motel or something. And, you know, I was a young attorney, like, you know, this guy has hired me for something. I'm like, oh, okay, this is great. And um, I'm like, you know, I don't know if it was naive, young. I was like, I'm going to take this case pro bono. I'm going to do this thing. And uh, my client is innocent. I believe him that anything that went on, it was consensual. And, you know, you start working on it. You're like, wow, this is really, this is a lot of stuff. And, you know, like, okay, you got DNA stuff you got to deal, worry about, investigation. Uh, had to hire investigators to go do it in my own pocket, right? And I can just tell you, crashed and burned. Wasn't pretty. Uh, it was just terrible, terrible, terrible. Now, the funny thing was, was the client who had, uh, you know, then gone to back to prison after he gotten released for a very similar act. Um <laughs> for years, for years, still sent me Christmas cards saying, thank you. Uh, but it was the biggest, I mean, it was stressful. It was a week of my time, not getting paid, you know, for the trial, uh, getting everything set up for the appeal. I mean, you name it, it was a pain. So I don't know why Mr. Pryor would do that. Um, just don't do it. Okay. I, you know, whenever you do something nice in the legal profession, uh, I hate to say it, you get burned. Um, and my guess is Mr. Pryor will get burned. Obviously, financially, he's getting burned. You know, you can't really get like a book deal. You know, your side, come tell your story. Uh, what's he going to do? Hit the talk show circuit? Um, something along those lines. Maybe if he wins, that'd be about the only time that they would really want to hear you there. And, um, but, you know, it, 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 it just, it just sucks. Right. And I hate to say it. Whenever you, you do something nice, and you're like, oh, it's not about the money. What do we say about the money, ladies and gentlemen? When they say it's not about the money, then you know it's really about the money. Anyway, so Mr. Pryor is going to go out there, uh, do this trial for the next eight to 10 weeks. Gratis, free. Would you work for eight to 10 weeks for free? I don't know. Like I said, I don't know what his financial situation is. But good for him. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Rainbow Zen Kitty. No good deed goes unpunished. Heck, I walked a guy on a homicide case. And you would think when he got his final bill, he would be like, oh, my God, thank you. Can I throw in a steak dinner to your best steakhouse? No. Yeah, I was looking at your bill. And uh, um, maybe you spent a little too much time preparing. Oh my God. And you're thinking, Oh my God. If I lost, the first thing you'd be doing is demanding all your money back and saying, I didn't prepare him enough. I mean, unbelievable. So it, it, it just goes to show you in the legal profession, you do something nice. Um, you do it. You, you just, and I hate to say it. I hate to, I mean, I hate to do it, but you can't, you can't do anything for free. You can't. Um, If you do it nice, then, um, you know, people expect you to handle it like any other case. But if you're doing it for free, you're like, well, no, I'll do it on my spare time, um, you know, which you don't have much of. So, yeah, it just never, ever, ever um, works out. So we'll have to wait and uh, see. 
we'll see, you know, I don't know. Uh, Mr. Pryor, good luck. You got a tough road ahead of you. The jury has been seated. They have been selected. They are what they refer to as death qualified. Remember, to be a death qualified juror, you have to say that you will consider imposing the ultimate punishment. If you say, I am morally opposed to the death penalty, guess what? You can't be on a death qualified jury because you can't consider all of the options that the uh, law could impose. And if you can't do that, then you can't follow the law, which means we've got to get rid of you. So that's the way that goes. Okay. Opening statements tomorrow. Like I said, 8.30 will bring it to you. Now, a couple of other things that are just a little weird. The um, court issued a, another order extending the scope and term of the non-dissemination order. And uh, that was dated, uh, let's just double check here. Yep, that was dated today. And, you know, I, I, I'm not really sure where we fit in. We're not media media, like in the sense we more commentators, I guess. Uh, but, you know, it's always the people that there's always somebody that ruins it for everybody, right? So there was already a non-dissemination order basically said that counsel shouldn't talk to media while this case is pending. And it ultimately said after opening statements, you can basically comment on the trial as long as you stay within the, conf the confines of the ABA model rules, which is don't say anything that basically isn't already out there in the public. And don't say anything that's going to totally um, do something to manipulate uh, public opinion, right? Well, why would you say something if you weren't going to do it? And this order, obviously, there was a non-dissemination order uh, early on in the case, and everybody followed it. Hence the reason why everything was done in chambers. Like I said, I've never seen anything like the Valo de Bell case where everything was done in chambers. Unbelievable to me. And then, um, you know, John Pryor did a quick little interview with an Idaho station, didn't talk anything about really the facts of the trial other than, hey, it's just little old me, me, John Pryor, up against the state of Idaho. And did I tell you how many district attorneys are going to be over there prosecuting the case? That's right. Not one, not two, not three, but at least four plus a whole investigative team support staff, not only from the local district attorney's office, but the attorney general has thrown in some help as well. And did I mention that as little old me, Mr. Pryor over here all by myself against the big old bad state against Chad Daybell. And that was really the gist of it. You know, kind of garner a little sympathy, stay within the bounds. But the court, you know, the prosecutors are like, oh, my God, you can't do this. Oh, my God, you're talking. You, you can't say this. Oh, my goodness. It was it was a pretty uh, perfunctory. Uh, didn't get into specific details. Asked about witnesses. He's like, I don't know who's going to be there. You just have to wait and see. I think he, he did everything he could within the bounds. Anyway. So everybody agreed that uh, anyone associated with the case, which include prosecuting attorney, defense attorney, any attorney representing a witness, victim, or victim's family, as well as the parties of the above entitled action, including but not limited to investigators, law enforcement personnel, and agents for the prosecuting attorney or defense attorney, and essential court staff directly involved in the trial in this case, are prohibited from making extrajudicial statements written or oral concerning this case between March 28th, 2024, until the conclusion of the case. Sounds very similar to the one that they put in the Koberger language. You think they're talking? Of course they are. It just doesn't. Um, they talk all the time. So what is it that actually happened? Well, apparently somebody from the uh, press had contacted court staff trying to ask about information that clearly was beyond the scope of when does the court resume? Uh, when can we do that? Um, so the court made it be known that no one's going to be talking about the case uh, until uh, uh, this case is over. And um can't talk about the evidence, the character, credibility, any opinions, et cetera, et cetera. 
And uh, apparently, like I said, it is because somebody from the press started asking some questions to court staff, made the court staff feel, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uncomfortable. And so the judge says, no one's going to say anything. There you go. So uh, it is what it is. You wouldn't expect much to get out of it. Hey, it doesn't matter. As long as we get to see it from gavel to gavel, that's the important part. We got to see the jury selection, voir dire process. We didn't get to see everybody exercise their peremptory challenges because uh, what that really came down to was that uh, they had to seat all the jurors in the courtroom and the courtroom wasn't big enough. And if they turned on the cameras, you'd see jurors. And obviously we don't want to identify the jurors. So the judge did a, you know, a little order and said, hey, we're not closing it. It's still open to the public. The you know People can come sit in the uh, area of the courtroom, but we're not closing the courtroom. We're not violating anybody's rights uh, by, by closing the courtroom because if they had closed the courtroom and not um, aired it, then that would have been uh, a problem. So there we go on that. But another weird little thing <laughs> in the Vallow case is that apparently somebody, and this is odd to me, Um, the court issued another order about a non-party moving to intervene. Now, as we all learned when former uh, or news people tried to get access to various things in the Lori Vallow trial, um, they were shut down. And the judge says, there's no way to intervene in a criminal case. You can't do that. And, well, the Idaho Supreme Court was like, well, yeah, I mean, it is kind of your, your third-party intervener uh, because you can litigate these issues as it relates to uh, access to the press. Uh, they also did that in the Koberger matter. So anyway, the judge issued another order in the day bail trial, which just, like I said, makes everything just weird, okay? Uh, so on March 29th, uh, a non-party presented a filing captioned its motion, M-O-T-I-O-N-E, to intervene and to continue the uh, trial in these proceedings. And then it says, counsel for the state and counsel for the defendant alerted the court after they received a notification of service through the court e-filing system. Both the state and the defense have raised concerns about the impropriety of this attempt to intervene procedurally and substantively. Additionally, both the state and the defense have requested the court immediately seal the document or alternatively strike it from its case. And um, a little footnote down here, it says, uh, notably, the pleading contains an inaccurate case number. And additionally, it contains a co-defendant listed in the caption, a clear violation of the court's order of August 6, 2021, directing that all pleadings in each case must contain only the individual defendant's name and case number. So there you go. Anyway, the court reviewed the pleading and pursuant to the Idaho court administrative rules upon request of the parties, the court will temporarily seal the motion pending further reveal until such time the court can call a hearing uh, for a determination of whether the motion will remain sealed or unsealed and uh, set the substance of the motion for hearing. Um, anyway, so, you know, it's a motion basically for sealing, but wouldn't you like to know who is filing a motion to continue Chad Daybell's jury trial? Uh, who had the chutzpah to do that, uh, completely screw it up and not only send it to the attorneys when they were going to e-file it, but also, uh, to a lot of other, uh, people as well. Um, so yeah, I, I, um, you just can't make this stuff up, ladies and gentlemen, you can't make this stuff up. And the more bizarre the case it is, the more bizarre things are going to take place. And let me assure you, ladies and gentlemen, okay, ask any trial lawyer this and, or judge district court judge, and they will tell you something always takes place at trial that you 
can't nobody anticipates completely out of the blue uh, you just don't think it's going to happen that particular way a witness will say something completely turn something around you just never know like you know you a bunch of your jurors will get uh food poisoning or something i'm telling you um every trial has a twist no matter how um mundane um you know that th th that it is i mean it's it's just uh it's just uh silly um so yeah i mean my guess is total wackadoo total wackadoo uh filed the motion and it's probably not worthy of any mention at all but i think it is worthy to show that um you know high profile trials bring out all of the nut jobs all right so we got uh, the Chad Daybell trial, and um, we should be having another hearing in the Koberger matter rather quickly because remember the judge, they were going to set everything and have basically weekly hearings, um, anything along those lines, and um, nothing's been set. No, no order as to the next hearing date, but the uh, parties have all filed their responses as it related to the big scandal brouhaha as it related to uh the uh questionnaire that was being sent out the survey that the defense was conducting to uh present empirical data as it related to the motion for a change of venue um once again i seem to be on the uh, wrong side of a lot of people's opinions uh, which is okay because I'm just calling the way I've seen it. And um, like I said, um, tried this before, done surveys, looked at these types of things. And usually no matter how hard you try, the judge will say, let's wait and see if we can get a jury in voir dire, unless it's just a slam dunk. Like I said, trying a lot of cases um, over the years and w many high profile cases and one that was actually ever moved. And that was a small little case in San Miguel County, AKA Telluride, Colorado, where a little band of gypsies, you know, were traveling and on this property with people's consent. And uh, let's just say ultimately some bad things happened. Like, I don't know, two dead children under the age of 10. They were basically left in a car and mummified. Um, and, uh, you know, somebody had somebody had to pay. Somebody had to pay. Uh, but everybody knew about that case in that particular case. And, you know, like I said, I couldn't go in and say, well, Judge, I was at dinner last night. And uh, the waitress asked why we were in town. And I said, hey, a little trial. Do you know anything about this? And they're like, oh, let me tell you all about it. Right? That's complete anecdotal. Not going to do it. Um, you have to do a survey. You have to do something formalized. You have to hire somebody so it doesn't look like you're just totally biased. It has to be done like anything, right? Well, within, we're within a, a margin of error of plus or minus 2% based upon the polling data, right? That's all they're doing. And so we read you uh, the questions that were all about the big brouhaha and uh, somehow prejudicing all the jurors in Lataw County where the prosecution believed that they were not going to get a fair trial. Like, did you know that, wait for it, did you know that Brian Koberger was arrested at his parents' home in Pennsylvania? <gasps> How dare they ask such a question? I know none of our Crime Talk aficionados had heard any of that information, and you now have all been completely tainted. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. No, no, no. We would all know that because it was general information in the public domain. In fact, if I recall correctly, when Mr. Koberger was brought back, Frank, the producer here, the hardest working man in show business, was tracking the plane on FlightAware on his return flight back from Pennsylvania to Idaho. Because he got arrested at his parents' house. And then he got stopped by police. 
and that he was a student there and that his DNA was there. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. And this is the big blah, blah, blah that everybody made. Oh, 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 this is terrible. Oh my God. This is a travesty of a mockery of a sham. The whole thing has been tainted. We must begin again. I was just, I was like, what is everybody getting all spun up about? The defense attorney, Ms. Taylor, she's like, judge, we do this all the time. We do this all the time, particularly in a death penalty case. Here we go, right? Uh, it's funny. I was I was talking with a uh, an attorney friend about that whole issue, and I you know I said you know I've, I've only had one case in almost thirty years change a venue, and she was like same, same, and it was the same type of situation. It was a horrible case that uh, she was working with another attorney on, and it was um, you know all the attorneys multiple co defendant kind of a it was a gang rape case, generally understanding. And um, the it, it was in and it was in um, uh, liberal Boulder, Colorado, where you know the judge and everything, we can get a fair jury, we can do this, right? And they did all the survey with all the pretrial publicity, and the judge was like, No, we're just gonna wait and see. And it wasn't until they kept trying to pick a jury, they kept trying to pick a jury. And they couldn't get enough people because they all kept saying, well, you know, I mean, obviously I respect everybody and I want everybody to come, you know, to America and to Boulder and to be able to do what they want. But if they come up here and they start sexually assaulting, you know, uh, young, pretty, uh, white uh, 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 college students, well, that's where I just put my foot down and uh, no, I can't give them a fair trial. And this attorney was telling me, uh, like, literally, she's like, like, the judge was just devastated. Like, this is my community. She said the judge looked absolutely devastated that in hippie Boulder, Colorado, they couldn't get a fair jury for a very serious case. And so, you know, yes, the defense can submit all the evidence they want, but the judge may say, Let's just wait and see. But you may have to bring in such a large jury pool, okay? And even in my case that we got moved from little San Miguel, which is Telluride, which I would have loved to have spent three weeks in Telluride, uh, you know, it would have been great. But instead, they moved the same judicial district over to Montrose. Montrose, Colorado, a lovely place, gateway to Telluride. And I wish that I had bought lots and lots of property in Montrose 20 years ago uh, because, well, I would be a bazillionaire by now because everybody's uh, buying it. Um, um, who's the guy that have his, has his plane there? It's not. It's the polo guy, Ralph Loren. Keeps his plane at the Montrose Airport. At Montrose Airport. Um, because I think it actually has a longer runway than it does in Telluride. And, you know, those big Gulf streams are a little tough to get in and out of. Um, so beautiful place. But I think in that particular case, we brought it, we were planning on bringing in 600 jurors. And so it is a, a, uh, quite a thing. Um, let's see here. Somebody said this, I, I live there. I grew up in Moscow. There are three one zero. He got his phone number. Okay. I'm not sure. I guess I missed that, but Rose, because I know I lived there, grew up in Moscow. Also, their 310, he got their phone on Moscow. Okay. Uh, Secret Squirrel Amy had jury duty today. All right, Amy. Congratulations. I'm glad you showed up, did your civic duty, and the um, system works when people show up to do their jury service. Um, as you all know, if you've been following me, you noticed I was gone for about a month. Excuse me. We had um, a jury trial, basically the month of March, month, the entire month of March. And it was a doozy. It was a knockdown drag out. And, uh, you know, we knew where we were going to be. We'd blocked out the whole month for the trial. We were hoping it was only going to take three weeks, but it took four. And, you know, you get these jurors which I mean is truly, truly commendable because they show up and their little juror summons says, you know, you're going to serve 
you know, one trial or one day, uh, and the average trial, you know, usually lasts about three days. And so, you know, these people are showing up like, I'll oh, telling their boss, I'll be in, I'll be in, I'll be in for work. Uh, no problem. I'll, I'll get out of this. No sweat. And, you know, these people get notified, Hey, by the way, if you're selected, guess what? Um, and we brought in a hundred jurors, um, and we used almost all of them to get down to our presumptive jury plus the alternates and, um, be told, Hey, by the way, you could be here for the next month. I think after day three or five, they start getting $50 a day for pay as a jury. And so it is truly commendable to all jurors, whether you show up and the guy pleads out or you wind up spending the month there that uh, the system does not work without it. Remember, most people in countries around the world do not get a jury trial, a jury of their peers where a jury is not somehow, you know, uh, beat up and tortured if the uh, prosecutors didn't get the uh, verdict that they wanted. So it's very rare, and like I said, hats off there to Secret Squirrel Amy, who did jury duty, um, and I'm glad you did it. Like I said, it doesn't work without you. So I, like I said, I think it was amazing, I'm, not to digress too much, but we had this trial, like, okay, this is great. And, um, you know, we're walking out. Of course, you can't talk with jurors. The, the jurors are instructed that, hey, um, the attorneys, they're nice people, uh, they can't talk with you. They're not going to make eye contact you. They're going to ignore you, move away, etc. And remember the first night, you know, you're boxing up, you're carrying all your bags or something to that effect. And the court clerk is telling the juror on the way out, you know, I'm just walking, making a beeline. Uh, is there a microwave or something that if I can bring my food, uh, because I'm not going to be working and I won't be able to afford to eat out every day. And, you know, you really, it, it kind of, it was so impressive um, that basically this financial hardship, right? This financial hardship for this person who's just trying to make it, right? And and there were there was some talk when when this person uh, did it, um, has you know had already um, uh, you know had had some financial hardships. Like, yeah, probably maybe I'll get paid, maybe I won't, but you know it's my civic obligation. Oh. We'll figure it out. And um, yeah, I saw that. And then, um, so then, uh, you know, like I said, th this person, because of their civic obligation, willing to sacrifice a month of pay basically from their employer. I mean, there's nothing that says the employer has to pay you. They can't fire you, but they don't have to pay you your salary while you're gone. And so this person's like, yeah, I, I, I won't be working, so I won't have money to eat. So I'm going to have to bring food. And they're willing to do this hardship for um, a person that they've never met. In fact, nobody. I mean, the prosecutors they never met, the defense attorney, the client that they've never met, a complete and total stranger. And they'll say, you know what? I will do this as my civic obligation, and I will pay attention and give you my undivided attention for the next month because that's what a good citizen does. And I just think that that is um, so commendable. It just truly, you know, when when you think, <laughs> you, you just can't believe that people can be any worse to people ever again. Guess what? Um, they, they um, somebody comes through and, and restores uh, your faith in mankind. And, um, you know, that's, that's amazing to me. All right. Now I've seen here a couple of things. Um, that the, uh, young man that was going to go out and be a farmer out there in, uh, areas of Utah, Apparently, his they believe that his remains have been found, which is certainly a, a relief, I'm sure, for the young man's family. I think they, everyone had kind of assumed that he had been dead. But authorities in Box Elder County said they believe they found the remains of Dylan Rounds, a young man who went missing nearly two years ago. 
Uh, Rounds was 19 when he went missing back in 2022. He was last seen over the Memorial Day weekend in Montello, Nevada, which is about 30 miles west of his uh, home in a small town of Lucen. He had moved there from Idaho to start his own farm, according to his family. And according to the Box Elder County Sheriff's Office, they recovered skeletal remains in a remote area in or near Lucen. The remains are presumed to belong to Rounds. Uh, they have turned the remains over to the Utah State Medical Examiner to confirm the identity. James Brenner, 60, uh, was charged last year with murdering Rounds, along with the abuse or desecration of a body. Brenner had been reportedly squatting on a remote piece of property near Rounds' property. And investigators say that they found a pair of Rounds' boots about five miles west of where he lived. And the uh, filing documents also uh, filed said that uh, uh, Rounds' blood was found on the boot along with uh, Brenner's DNA. Uh, they apparently also have Rounds' uh, mobile phone records, which showed him in the area where Brenner was squatting. Uh, the last signal from Rounds' phone was a point nearby, and his phone was eventually found in a pond. Uh, on Rounds' phone, investigators found a time-lapse video showing Brenner's cleaning a gun with blood stains on his arms and his shirt. The video was taken around the time of the disappearance. Police also obtained the shirt Brenner was wearing in the video and confirmed that Round's DNA was on it. Investigators state that they interviewed Brenner and he made several claims that corroborated forensic evidence in addition to making numerous false statements. Um, apparently, Brenner led authorities to where he was buried as part of a plea agreement. So... Um, obviously, our heart goes out to the uh, family of Dylan Rounds. And, you know, sometimes that is what it takes for the prosecutors to solve a case, cut a deal for some sort of leniency. I'm sure Mr. Brenner will be uh, spending the remainder of his natural life in uh, prison. But, you know, that's what you have to do. Um, we had a, a, it was a horrific, I hate to always spring up all these cases when, whenever somebody starts asking, well, let me tell you the story once, you know, the lovely Miss Kristen is always like, oh my God, don't share these stories. Like, oh my God, you know? Um, and I'm just like, this is what happens, man. People need to know what happens in the world that there truly is evil out there. Anyway, it was a dead baby case. And, um, I represent, I had the mother of the baby, of course, the boyfriend, you know, who's watching the baby. Um, I'm not speaking at school here, killed the child and, uh, make a long story short. They found the child off in some little, you know, wooded area, but it was because the defendant had to show them where it was. Why did he have to do that? Well, because that's what he did to avoid the death penalty. And I know a lot of people don't like the death penalty. I get it. Shouldn't be used in every case. I get it. But it is a huge bargaining chip for the prosecution. And to remove the prosecution's hands from that, I think it's wrong. And I also believe that since the United States Supreme Court has said that it's not cruel and unusual punishment, you know, if they were going to, you know, tar and feather you first before they, you know, electrocuted you or lethal injected you, or now I think they do something where they suck all the air out of your lungs or something along those lines. But um, they're always coming up with new and creative ways uh, to do that. But, um, you know, the Constitution says they can do that. The government can do that. People are like, well, the government shouldn't be doing that. I get it. And you can agree to disagree, right? Um, and like I said, it, it shouldn't be, it, sh it needs to be used for the worst of the worst. Okay. And I assure you, I think most prosecutors know when the death penalty is the worst of the worst. The one case that I had, you know, the guy had already had a, another homicide 
case. And it was a horrific case. You know, we had three dead bodies, a fourth one, you know, I mean, it was just terrible, nasty. And, um, it's, it's safe for the worst of the worst, but it should be. So I get it. But even if you were morally opposed to it, um, you still, I think you don't want to tie the prosecutor's hands to that, um, not having that tool. I mean, basically it's like going to Costco, I guess you start getting that, that, um, Oh, uncivil law. See, we have such smart people. Uncivil law. Nitrogen asphyxiation, Scott. They don't suck out of your lungs. They put 100% nitrogen in the environment. For my money, definitely the best way to go. Um, yeah, I could do. I, I could see that. Um, not nitrogen, like, uh, but I, you know, like uh, when I do my flight training, we have to practice um, a rapid depressurization. You know, you're clu- cruising around at 41,000 feet. Boom, something happens. What do you do? Boom, you take, you know, put your little mask on as quick as you can. You got about three to five seconds to don it. Probably at 41,000, yeah, probably not much. The people in the back, uh, probably not going to do so so well uh, because, boom, you know, everything is sucked out of your, uh, uh, out of your, your lungs. You just die. So it would be quick. But yeah, so uncivil law, I, uh, I agree with you there. Um, Frank, can you shoot uncivil law? I think last time he, he ditched us. We're going to shoot him a link. See if he wants to join us here real quick. All right. Uncivil law. If you're going to contribute like that, we might as well shoot you a link and you can see if you uh, want to join us as well. It's been a while since we uh, have spoken. That's for sure. Um, if you dip in, look, let's see here. Uh, there's no death penalty in my case, my state, and I'm glad completely oppose it. And, and I, I totally, um, uh, Michelle, uh, you know, respect that people can have differing, um, opinions. And I, like I said, I think, <laughs> well, I think I asked last time, I'm like, Hey, uncivil laws on here, Frank, shoot him an email. And we never heard back. And I think I didn't see your name uh, after that. I get it. There was probably better entertainment somewhere else. I don't know. Uh, but we'll try again. All right. Anyway, Frank just sent you uh, an email, a link to see if you wanted to uh, uh, possibly join us. I mean, the death penalty is a, um, I mean, it's it's a personal thing. And that's why, you know, it's the law. And when you death qualify these juries, uh, everyone has to be able to say, I will at least consider it. It doesn't mean you have to impose it, right? And even if you have 12 jurors, only one juror can say no. And that is not unanimous. And, um, you know, that's the, the way it works. All right. Let's bring in uncivil law. How are you, sir? We can hear you. Oh, can we hear? Can you hear me? No, we can't hear you. Let's try this again. Hello. Yes. Can you hear me now? Test one, two, three. Oh, yes. Okay, great. I'm working now. Nope. Got nothing. No, you can't hear me. Here, hold on. Uh oh, danger, and Frank. It looks it looks okay on my end. Let's try it again. Uh, experiencing technical difficulties, I guess. Um. Uh-oh. Oh, quick question: When we're waiting to get to this uh, sound thing figured out, uh, any thoughts on the Apple River stabbing trial? Well, I was actually watching the Apple River stabbing trial today and uh the defendant in the case was testifying he did okay uh i didn't get to see all of the um oh somebody says they can hear you uh can you hear uncivil law i i can hear you fine oh there we go yeah there we go now we can all hear each other all right how are you my friend it's been a while since we've chatted I'm doing well. I'm in my new digs in Houston. I moved from Austin. Got a new background. Life isn't bad. Well, oh, good. And you'll be you'll be pleased to know that I'm working on my very first U.S. Supreme Court petition. So, I'll let you know how it turns out. Congratulations! I uh, got a notification that my little certificate from the United States Supreme Court yes. that I got framed should be arriving. But when it arrives, I think we'll know what it is based upon the shape. It looks, it I looks think I'm going to save it. 
There you go. You got it over there. Yep. Yep. Um, that was our, uh, you know, people ask me, they're like, well, did you argue? Nope. Nope. Um, yeah. I, I was riding the coattails. If you had told but, me you were gone, man, I was sponsored you. I could have gone there and stood up for you. It would been great. Yeah. Um, it was, it, it all worked out. Had a couple of uh, local sponsors that uh, said it would be an honor to do so. It was, and that was an honor for me to, to do that. And then we, we went and we really didn't know if we were going to be able to get in because it was unclear whether they were going to swear in, you know, new admittees because there's only that certain amount of space there in the actual chambers. But as it turned out, we were literally right behind the solicitor general. Oh yeah. Line. So you had the council table, you know, maybe four feet from us. And then right in front of us were the solicitor generals who have their little seats. So we were, you know, second row uh, watching the United States uh, Supreme court uh, in action. It was probably the, one of the best moments in my career. And I thought I've had some pretty good moments and uh, that was certainly the highlight of it for sure. It's definitely the best seats in the house when you're getting sworn in. Uh, that's for sure. Yeah. I was over like, on the left-hand side and uh, I was like one or two rows back. It's like, if I'd really tried, I could have probably reached out and touched the arguing lawyers. It's great. You know? Oh yeah. That's, that's, that's totally what it was. And um, there's some smart people in that room and whether people, uh, agree or disagree with those uh, smart people, yeah. uh, you can tell they're pretty smart. They really are. I, I'll tell you what, I've covered a lot of arguments on my channel, and I'm really impressed by the current Solicitor General, Preligar. Uh, she is just unbelievably smart. She has perhaps the best frame control of m any advocate I can think of in recent memory at the Supreme Court. She's just really unbelievable. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I listen to those occasionally. We were putting them up uh, there for a while, but not a lot of people like to listen to Supreme Court arguments. I don't. I don't get it. You have to be a total uh, Supreme Court geek like us uh, to to uh, truly appreciate that, I guess, and to realize how much work goes into those briefs. Yeah. Well, do I dare ask what the issue is in your petition? I haven't. I haven't talked about it really openly on my channel, but when I file it, I'll let you know. Okay. All right. That's, that's, uh, I get it. Um, I've only filed two other petitions on my own and they've both been denied. Um, even though yeah. I thought they were brilliant issues and I thought they were, it was amazing the way they were legally framed as well. I'm sure. So, yeah. I'm a little bit scared on the, why should we take this case portion of the, of the brief for the cert petition? Cause that's where things get tricky. It's like, if I can get the Supreme court to take the case, I think I can win, but well, getting them to take the case is the tricky part. Well, I remember, it's only two percent of all cases that. Oh, it's less than that. It's like it's like one out of one hundred sixty, Scott. Is it that low? Okay, I yeah. know it was like very small. It was very oh, yeah. small. Yeah. Um, no. ours, ours, it's, better, it's better odds than winning the lottery. So I got that going for me. <laughs> I would rather win the lottery, to be honest with you, like that billion, two billion dollar one or billion dollar one that yeah, yeah. took place last week that uh, wasn't there. So yeah. Um, so yeah. So what else is going on? Your channel's going well. Channel's going well. I'm exercising more. I've been going to the gym. I moved to Houston, at least in part, because Nate, the lawyer, moved from New York City to Houston about six months ago, and he's one of my best friends. So we're okay. living here, and uh, Attorney Tom also is in my space, sort of in the online creation space. He lives here in Houston, so we've got a little Houston contingent now developing. Oh, good. And been going to the gym Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I went to see the Eclipse yesterday. That was a lot of fun. I had a great time there. Yeah, well, Frank went out and took a very cool picture of the eclipse uh, here at the office for us. And I'll be honest with you, I was in my office and didn't even notice it, if it got dark at all. It was, uh, I, I think my office is on the wrong side uh, to where it was supposed to be. But uh, yeah. yeah. But yeah, talking a little bit more about nitrogen asphyxiation as a death penalty method, one of the interesting things about it is your body doesn't notice it because the body doesn't react to the lack of oxygen. It reacts to the buildup of carbon dioxide. So when you when you get that sensation like you have to breathe or you're having struggling breathing, it's because your body can't get rid of carbon dioxide. Um, the air the air is naturally um, mostly uh, nitrogen any, anyway. It's uh, 70, what is it? Because the oxygen is 21%. So nitrogen is 79% of the atmosphere with 1% other. So nitrogen is most of the air you breathe anyway. So you're, you're breathing nitrogen all the time. 
So all you do in a, in a nitrogen asphyxiation is you crank the number up from 79% to 100%, so you're no longer getting oxygen. But since you can still you exhale, go. since you can ex still exhale, you don't get the sensation that you can't breathe. So basically, you just start to feel very lightheaded, and you, you just kind of pass out and, and die. And people do it unintentionally um, with some modest notability in the workplace. It, you can run into environments where you have bad air because you're in an environment where the air doesn't circulate in like enclosed environments uh, mm -hmm. where, you know, air gets trapped and you can actually run to situations where there's not enough oxygen in the room because there's no circulation or um, industrial accidents, same kind of thing. And people don't even know what's happening to them. You just get that lightheaded sensation and then you pass out and you're gone. So, man, if you have to go, nitrogen asphyxiation is great. I mean, it's better than anything, even like uh, cyanide poisoning, like when they do, you know, the gas chamber. I mean, you're breathing the cyanide. It's it's yeah. caustic. It's caustic. Yeah. You can feel that you're breathing cyanide. Your body isn't very happy with the breathing cyanide. You will notice. Uh, the nitrogen asphyxiation, not so much. You will not notice. And uh, you go peacefully into that good night. So if you have to if you have to pick an option, it's my it's my vote. If I ever get a choice, Scott, I'm saying. Well, right. hey, you, you know, um, just as long as it's quick, right? Quick and yeah. painless. That's what really, really matters uh, at yeah. the end of the day, right? Yeah. Um, so what cases are you following these days? Well, the one I'm covering now, I've been covering the jury selection, and I was covering it before, was the Chad Daybell trial. I'm planning on covering mm -hmm. that every day. Yeah, so we've been we've been training. following that. Um, you know, they got death qualified, uh, jury seated. And uh, opening statements resume tomorrow, or will start tomorrow, and then the case will yes. go. So It's the um, first time that any of us in the law tube genre have done a death penalty case. So that will be interesting to see how that plays out on a lot of different dynamics. Triple murder, two dead children. Yeah. Cult murder case. Plus, I bought the books, Scott. It was a tax write-off because I get to read them on stream. That makes That's it a right. business expense. Absolutely. So I, I have in between breaks been reading the works of Chad Daybell. He wrote a whole left behind clone post apocalyptic Mormon fiction. And uh, so far, we're in the early days of it where the US government has released the chip that everyone's getting installed into their right hand, don't you know? Okay. And, uh, things, are, things are heating up as the Mormon church, apparently, in the book, has ended all missions worldwide. And okay. we called everyone back to the United States because of concerns of the end times. How exciting. Uh, yes. Um, well, you know, I still think uh, the defense is going to try to downplay his uh, writings. And they're going to make this guy out to be the biggest bumbling boob that you could possibly imagine. Who gets, you know, Lori Vallow, you know hot, hot uh, lady, so to speak, in many people's eyes, she starts paying attention to him for whatever reason. And, you know, she thinks he's a celebrity. I don't know. They're going off to the never world along with their 143,999 friends. And uh, he just kind of went along for the ride. That's what I think it's going to be. And he, as, as you heard John Pryor bring up, you know, the little shiny objects aren't always what they uh, appear to be. Did you hear? Do you remember that uh, when he started talking about it, voir dire? I heard a lot of things. I heard a lot of things about cheesy eggs and airplanes. Yeah, I didn't get the cheesy egg thing. Like yeah, I want a my way. Like, I, I don't know. It, 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 it. I don't know. It was. It was. It was interesting, um, in a lot of regards. But you know, everybody's not supposed to pitch their case in voir dire, but everybody pitches their case in voir dire. Because both sides want to know what those jurors are going to react to. And like, ooh, I thought I liked that one. Maybe I didn't, you know? Yeah, so. it's, a bit, it's a bit of a – It was a, I, I, I struck me as a bit of a weird analogy when she, the prosecutor was talking about, you know, what, what would you think about an airplane pilot telling you, well, maybe I could land the plane. How would that make you feel? And I feel, well, that analogy isn't quite appropriate for a juror because unlike a juror, 
a airplane pilot has had training and courses and gone to a school and had instructors and taken tests and got a licensing and everything else. I, I don't yeah. know a lot of jurors who went to juror school. So the airplane no. pilot can express confidence because, you know, they have the training to back the confidence. Where is this confidence coming from from the juror? How am I supposed to know how I'd react? I've never been in this situation before. It's a weird question. Yeah, I, I thought it was a weird question. I didn't really get it. Um, I mean, and I, you know, I always get beat up. They're like, oh, you're just a defense hack, Scott, for the prosecution. You know, you hate the prosecution. You beat them up. No, I mean, I pick on, not pick on, but I critique um, both sides. And, you know, and I, for example, I, um, I didn't think the prosecution was very good in the Daybell trial. Mm -hmm. I thought the defense attorneys were horrible in the, in the uh, Lori Vallow trial. I'm sorry. In the oh, Vallow trial. Uh, you in mean Vallow? Yeah, uh, that I mean, one. yeah. I obviously that one wasn't broadcast. I mean, there was audio, but with a day behind, I wasn't keeping attention. I thought you meant maybe the Crumbly case because I was covering that sentencing hearing today. And yeah, I we reminded, covered. I was reminded how much I dislike the attorney for uh, Jennifer Crumbly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she was she was not great. But I don't know how you feel about this. But I, you know, I get it. Everybody wants everyone to have justice, and they're going to make them feel good. But I think it's a dangerous, slippery slope. Uh, the precedent that this case sets, where basically we're yeah. saying we're going to send you to jail for being a bad parent. Um, oh, yeah. It's terrible. It's terrible. I tell people, be careful what you wish for, because mm -hmm. you may get it on your front doorstep. Yeah. When the prosecutor was telling both juries, uh, like, basically, don't worry, this won't happen to you. You'll never be sitting in the defendant's seat. I'm like, that's a lie. <laughs> do, do you not know how common law works? Do you, do you not understand how this system of government works? It's like, this is not this is not a one-time only thing, man. You've laid down a brick, and bricks Everybody, laid down upon it. It just takes that one person to win. I know, for example, years ago, it was revolutionary here. Somebody was going to try it. A guy was driving down the highway so fast you know, hits an accident. And normally it's like, you know, vehicular assault, reckless, you know, you're looking at 12 years in prison. Well, you do murder too. They went first degree murder, Ooh. extreme indifference, you know, complete Ooh. reckless disregard. And one guy won, you know, one prosecutor won and you just started seeing it more and more and more and more. And, and, and that's what people don't get. It's like, man, I mean, and I get that, you know, if you're driving like a madman down a crowded highway, that could potentially be extreme indifference. I get that. But when you start saying, we're going to hold you responsible for something that you didn't knowingly participate in, yeah. that you didn't knowingly encourage, yeah. but we're going to hold you to this reasonable man standard, which is basically a negligence standard of the civil world, right? Is it reasonably yeah. foreseeable? Well, gee, I don't know. Is it reasonably foreseeable that my kid is going to go shoot up the school well, he's never done it before. He's never said he's going to go do it. We never had to take the gun away from him because he was going to go do it. So I would say, how is that reasonably foreseeable if you want to go there? Which is the whole problem when you start saying, you know, what a reasonable parent should have done. No, that's a civil world. Go sue them with that. The criminal law, you knowingly do something. You intentionally do something. But that's my humble opinion. I mean, school shootings are still like a one in a million event. I mean, I haven't done the math and crunched it, but we're still talking about an ultra rare event. Like how foreseeable can it be, man? Well, think about it. We had the Columbine shooter case. And I know people that were in that school when that happened, like students at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and they didn't prosecute those parents. I mean, those kids were down there for months and months and months. Uh, Klebold and Harris you know, making their bombs and, and planning and doing everything, right? They never prosecuted the parents saying, well, you're a bad parent. You should have known that this was going to take place, right? There's, There's always time, law. right? There's always time. Bring them as accessory charges, <laughs> right? That's got to be uncapped. Ah, yeah, just just pass a law. We're going to uh, uh, pass a law uh, taking away the statute of limitations on any law uh, mm -hmm. so that, uh, you know, we can prosecute bad parents of school shooters, right? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, but that's what they do because it makes everybody feel good. Criminal law is mens rea. You knowingly did something. You knew what you were doing. You're aware of your conduct. Know that it was practically certain to result in that conduct, right? Intentionally do it. Not, well, we're going to armchair quarterback and you should have known. You should have known better. You're a bad parent. 
there was there was many things about the Crumbly case that confused me. One of the things that was weird to me was when the Court of Appeals made the decision to allow the charges to go forward, they wrote as part of their decision that it would be reasonably foreseeable that the parents could have foreseen that the sh that the that their kid would have committed a shooting on that day. And they said it twice that they said on that day. And that was not part of the jury instructions, Scott, nor did I see either defense lawyer uh, bring right. that up to the judge. Be like, wait a second. The, no. the, the Court of Appeals just said that the, that apparently, I mean, this is a way to read it, that what we're supposed to find is that they could have foreseen that the shooting would occur on that day. And it's not in the jury instructions. So I'm like, am I missing something? Or why did neither defense lawyer bring it up? It confuses me. And also, what if you can yeah. explain to me under what BS interpretation of reality that diary qualifies as present sense impression, I'd love to hear it because it sounds like complete nonsense to me. Absolute nonsense. But you know what? You know who some of the worst uh, people, <laughs> judges that that uh, don't understand the rules of evidence are trial judges. Hmm. Um, a lot of them just never had to deal with it. And they're like, oh, we just allow it in. You know, it's... Present sense impression, good enough. I mean, you could, you could go look it up, Scott. It's in the book. Yeah. Um, it, well, yeah, I look it up all the time, right? Yeah, I always take my yeah, book, yeah, Judge, yeah, here it is. Yeah. I think I, after, you know, almost 30 years, one thing I may know is the rules of evidence, because um, that's usually the only thing we can to keep stuff out, right? On the defense side. And uh, yeah, just, 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 I don't know, that, that whole case I think is terrible. And I know there's a lot of people, and I upset a lot of people when I said it where i said it's a dangerous precedent you know there's like oh it's a unique and novel case oh yeah it's yeah, that... coming to us coming to a city near you soon yeah those those might be some of the most dangerous words you could ever say in the legal system i, I just try to, to explain to people look we we are built on a common law tradition what that means is we're built on precedent everything happens based on what happened before yep. Uh, yep. i've read the case and I, i'm sure you have uh, the the f very first civil assault case that ever happened it's it's documented it was 1414 in uh, the united kingdom and you can actually go read the case the very first time and a judge just invented the entire cause of action called assault because mm -hmm. they didn't hit the guy so it wasn't battery yep. or hit the woman more properly and it's like yeah oh yeah just this one time it's like no that's that's now the foundation of all assault yeah, it's like i go read it it's like yeah that's the thing one, all it I takes is one person to do it and another yeah. people go along with it and to yeah. say, well, you know, we'll just kind of wait and see how it turns out, but we'll, it'll probably be okay. And, you know, yeah. it won't be used that often. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, like I said, if you want to apply that yeah. to the parent, yeah. why not the school principal? Why not the teachers? Why not the counselors? Heck, why not the ones going all the way back to grade school that should have seen that this kid maybe wasn't wired correctly? Where does it stop? Well, it stops when the prosecutor thinks it stops. And, uh, you know, we had a very similar while we were talking earlier about this case. Uh, I had a double dead baby case over there in uh, Telluride years ago. And it was a child abuse. It's like, because they're like, well, you were on the property with these children. My guy's like, well, they're not my kids. And this big property, they were up here and I was down here. Oh, and my kids, they're totally healthy. But the prosecutor's argument was, well, it takes a village, so to speak. Yeah. And well, gee, that's funny because you're not charging the police officer who did the welfare visit when the tarp had the kids in there and had been dead. Mm. You're not charging him, right? Mm. How about the neighbors across the street? Mm. It's it is can be used very selectively for people they don't like. And I get it. The Crumleys are not likable people, but I don't think that they should have been uh, prosecuted. Sue them into oblivion, I guess, but this 15 years in prison, I just think it sends a bad legal precedent and I'm probably, you know, people are probably unsubscribing as I speak right now, but that's just the way it goes. <laughs> well, no, that's, that's one of the things that you, I think that a good lawyer needs to think about because you need to think about what happens next and, and what this speaks to the larger issue. And uh, one of the reasons I like the Supreme Court in particular is because you're always sort of thinking, you know, you're trying to meta game this out because you you recognize that you're not just talking about the case in front of you. You're talking about, 
you know, the next thousand cases because it's particularly it's because the Supreme Court influences every lower court and all their decisions. So you you start you have to at least to some degree try to metagame out what happens next, what happens next, and try to think about how to contain this in a in a way that makes sense so that the whole thing just doesn't completely explode the boundaries of the thing yeah and the, and and the crumblies are an excellent example of the uh the maximum that hard cases make bad law this is this is a hard case no one likes it four children are dead and the parents seem like douchebags plus mom on the stand yeah there's nothing i would change and then she tries to backpedal in sentencing not convincingly my yeah. dad so it's like oh. no one's exactly rooting for these people so the outrage which is perfectly understandable causes us to want to you know enact justice but unfortunately you can't do that without thinking about how that will apply to other cases in the future so forward yeah. thinking my friend I, well yeah, that's the job of lawyers right is to always think about the what ifs and particularly like you said the supreme court what if this what if we only answer this little narrow question <laughs> Versus this big question. Let's see how this develops over the next five to ten years uh, before something you know uh, you know happens that we don't have to decide. Uh, that's that's what they do. But you know, lawyers are always thinking, "What if this? What if this happens? What if this happens?" Um, I don't care if you're a civil lawyer, uh, criminal lawyer, whatever. You're always thinking, "What? What if?" So. Yeah, I remember we were doing uh, the Treehouse murder case. I think it was, and I was trying to figure out. I forget what I was trying to figure out about something about the theory of the case and where it came from. And it's, I, I traced it back to some 1890 murder in, in California. Like, cause it, it, everyone was playing like a game of telephone, right? They, mm -hmm. The Florida Supreme court was citing this case and that case cited this case. And so I tried to trace like all the way back and I found it, you know, found its root origin in, in California, you know, one brother stabs another brother. The the brother doesn't goes up to his bed, and I think he uh, winds up shooting himself to end the pain. And they charge the brother with murder, and they the California Supreme Court in that case upheld the murder cards for the guy who stabbed him. It's like you know yeah. because you set flu set the chain event, even though he's an intervening cause. That was the idea of like why is this what appears to be an intervening cause, not, you know, legally separating. It's like, well, because you stabbed him and he, you know, shot himself to end his pain, you're still on the hook for murder. And mm -hmm. I, I just find it funny, you know, that one case from 1890 becomes a game of telephone and you're, you're reading sort of all of its development and suddenly you're winding up in the treehouse murder case in Florida because of what happened in California oh, yeah. 20 years ago. And they're so relying that's how upon things it. Go, man. Yeah. But, but now tell me if I'm wrong, because, um, obviously, as an appellate lawyer, you got to look, go back all the time, do look at all that stuff. But um, I don't care if you went, you know, you go into the law library, mm -hmm. and you pull, let's say, a Pacific reporter, pick any reporter, Southwest, Southern, whatever, sure. and you pull one, one of the, not the second, third editions, we're talking like first, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And you open it up, and it's like from 1912, and you peruse those pages, nothing's changed. It's all the same stuff. I think that's that that's true in my own field of patent law like if you go read the very first patent act that was ever passed ever the venetian patent act i forget what year it is you know but they were the first one to ever create the patent law and you go read it and it's like three paragraphs long mm -hmm. it's the same thing it is today it's the exact that's same thing true. go back and look at an old criminal case and i swear it's the same thing they just changed the name oh they <laughs> They defiled the child and blah, blah. You know, I mean, just yeah, 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 it's, yeah, it's yeah, the yeah. same, same crimes, you know, murder, uh, sexual assault, uh, thefts, burglary, con men. It's the same stuff. The only thing that changes are the means by which they engage in, in, you know, what they do. And, uh, it's, it's funny, but all the same issues. Um, I, I think it's, I, I like going to a, a law library and just go, pull an old book and just read, read the stuff. It's, it's very interesting to me because it, nothing changes. It's all the same. It's all been hashed out before. Uh, we just act like we, it's new. We're going to put a new, yeah. new spin on it. Yeah. Like the first assault case, if memory serves correctly, it's IDS at Ooks. Uh, it's I of S and his wife versus mm -hmm. whatever the case, the facts of the case are thus, uh, woman, woman and her husband are, are, are in home at night. They live in their tavern. 
They're tavern owners, and they also live there. So it's night. The tavern is closed. They've boarded up all the windows. Some guy comes to their tavern and wants a drink. So he starts beating on the windows, you know, to open up because he wants a drink. A drunk. It's a it's a drunken guy trying to get a drink. What are the odds, Scott? Right? So oh my god. The, yeah, yeah, he's, you he's mean, mean alcohol on, affected people negatively hundreds wow, of years ago as well as it is today. He's beating, he's beating on the window. the the wife of the The wife of the tavern, you know, opens up a window and he takes a swipe at her with his axe. He misses. Yeah. He misses and he hits the building. And that's the very first assault case ever. It's like it could write it today. It's the same thing. Yeah, drunk guy yep. gets out of control, wants more drink, gets unhappy that the bartender cut him off. <laughs> that's you know, it's like that's the same thing. I know, exact same yeah, thing. Yeah. Nothing changes. Nothing changes. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, are you following the Koberger case as well? Because we I am following. following I am that. following the case it, 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 as well. It's interesting that the judge is so salty about the the uh, the survey that they sent out. And I, I don't really know why the judge is so salty. And also, also, it just seems inherently obvious to me that this case has to be transferred for venue because this happened in a college town. The entire jury is college yeah, students. Exactly. Um, that, and, uh, and once again, no one, lives, have, no one lives there, Scott, except the college students. They might have a little bit of an opinion about it. Scott. And I guarantee you the people that do live there, they all know about it as well because it's the biggest yeah, thing yeah. they hit, hit, hit town ever. Uh, but once again, I, I get so much flack because I said, you know, watch, we watched this hearing. Uh, the prosecutor is, you know, this is a travesty of a mockery of a sham. I can't believe that yeah, this yeah, is taking yeah. place. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, the, the, the defense attorney, Ms. Riley, is like, what are you so spun up about? If we do this all the time, which this does take place all the time. And then the judge gets all kerfuffled that somehow he should have been involved in this. Like, no, judge, you're the judge. You call balls and facts when we present the issue for you to decide. What are you going to do? Ask the questions for us? Like, I just don't understand what everybody's so smart about. And when you hear the questions, did you know that Brian Koberger was arrested in Pennsylvania at his parents' home? Did you know that he drove a car similar to that? Do you know that he was driving around, right? Do you know that there was DNA evidence found on a, a sheath? Anyone who's... Even remotely like, follow the case, we probably yeah. heard that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the prosecutor was so outraged and, you know, basically an ex parte motion, and the judge signed it, you know, basically ex parte before the defense could even respond, which, you know, doesn't happen unless it's very rare circumstances. Yeah. And so, like I said, I'm just like, why is everybody all spun up about this? It's a prosecutor with histrionics. It's like, tell me another tale. We saw it. We see it a lot, you know, just the prosecutor like, I can, I never, with her old pearl clutching. It's like, geez, man, calm down. The the righteous indignation of the people, your honor. We, we just can't let this, I mean, they're actually out there doing their job, representing their client. And if you make us move this to Ada, and if you make us move to Ada, it's going to be really, really expensive. And if it's expensive, Judge, uh, you know, it's just going to be inconvenient for you, too. And, well, who cares? Everybody's entitled to a fair trial, right? You're going to get a fair trial just like Vallow and Daybell are getting in Ada. It's a bigger population to choose from. And you're going to be able to find a couple of people that lived under rocks that didn't know what was going on in Idaho. It's that simple. You know, it's just the way it is. But small counts, everybody knows everyone. Everybody knows everything. And they've all formed opinions. Oh, yeah. Big time. So, so the whole the whole thing seems definitionally futile to me. So I don't even know why we're, we're here at this point. It's like, if we want to do all the preliminary stuff here, I, I guess. But, dude, this thing has to be transferred for venue for trial. I, I, I just can't imagine... Why? And like I said, it doesn't happen often. Like I said, in my 29 years, I've had one case that actually got yeah. moved. And uh, the judge, you know, basically did it on her own because she knew that it was so, you know, uh, pervasive as it came to uh, media coverage in that small community. But otherwise, we were going to hire a survey company to go do and ask the exact same questions and say, look, judge. And she's like, no, I'm going to move it in my own judicial district over to to Montrose. And that's just, it's just the way it is. It's just the way you do it. Like quit, you know, don't engage in these things. Cause why that, it, that creates air. Like 
Judge, your job is to protect the record. Yes, give them a fair trial, both sides, but protect the record so that on appeal, there's nothing to appeal. That's what you got to do. That's what the judge is supposed to do. That would be nice. But they never do because they got the family members in the courthouse and, you know, the emotion of it and, you know, what have you. I mean, like I said, even the Crumleys, the judge could have thrown that case, thrown it out. And, you know, I, I, I know the Supreme Court said, well, go I mean, ahead. They, yeah, still. I mean, they tried to. The Court of Appeals, you know, threw it back in their face. But you still didn't have to let the diary in. You uh, you could have ch played with the jury instructions in light of what the Court of Appeals wrote. I mean, you can read as well as I can. It's like, you know. Nope. And, hey, you know what? If it comes back, it's on the judge. The judge is ultimately responsible for those jury instructions. And, um, you know, we'll we'll – you know, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. And the, other, and the other one that was sort of notable and sort of errors that I saw was that the prosecution apparently had an expert witness they wanted to call that would have testified about pathways of violence. And here's the pathways to violence. But what was interesting is that the prosecution's expert would have also testified that the experts have such a hard time predicting who will be a mass murderer and who will not. And there's been surveys done, and I believe one of the surveys was something like they gave a bunch of law enforcement officials, FBI and so forth, uh, text messages, for example, from cases that are known. So these are, these are established cases. And said, okay, is this text message or is this correspondence from someone who's a murderer, someone who's violent, is this someone yeah. we should be worried about? And yeah. the experts only got it right something like 30% of the time. And it's like, well, okay, if the experts get it right 30% of the time, what hope is there for the rest of us? And what struck me as odd is that the defense moved to disqualify the expert. And I'm like, not only would I not disqualify the expert, I'm going to subpoena them myself and put them in my case in chief because, you know, they can talk about pathways to violence all they want. But if I get this idea that it's not foreseeable, that no one could have foreseen this. There's no way they could have foreseen it. I win the game. Listen, so you, I was like, I don't know why for the life of me they they filed a motion and limited to exclude the experts. Like, I'll do the exact opposite of that. What's going yeah. on? Whenever you read any sort of evaluation of any kind where they're trying to predict the future, oh, they do the test and based upon the research, you know, 26% of the people have this, you know, trait or whatever. They all put in their little clause at the bottom. This is not predictive of future behavior, blah, 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 because you can't, right? It's always easy to say, looking back, eh, called that yeah. one, <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know, the dude wearing the, the, the trench coat to school every day, uh, <laughs> yep, called it, a little odd, right? But at the meantime, I mean, you can't use it to arrest people, right? I mean, you got to wait till they do something wrong. I hate to say it, but... That would be helpful. <sighs> yep. But hey, if as long as it makes everybody feel better, doesn't that just make you feel better? And therefore it's all okay. And you know, if somebody should go to prison, let it be the Crumleys. I mean, no, nobody likes them anyway. So what does it matter? And unless, of course, it's somebody that you like next time, and then it's maybe not so fair. Yeah. So, yeah, people never seem to think that far ahead for some reason. They never seem to think what happens when I'm on the wrong side of the V mark on this yeah. one of these things. It's like, yeah. Yep. Because the right. law and law is, at least, law is at least hypothetically supposed to be neutral. So it shouldn't matter who's who. It should just matter what is the rule. And so you, you should you should ideally want a rule that will apply to you. It's universal categorical imperativism. Yep. So I, I, that's what I'm all in favor of. Let's well, do that. One of my mods here reminded me, and I, I, I mentioned this today, is um, she sent me an article. There was a kid that was involved in a car accident, you know, two accidents kind of back to back. And people were shocked that this kid was driving another car again. You know, apparently the family had means and, you know, the insurance would be so high for everybody else. But yet he's out there doing it. And now he's committed another accident. And the people were talking about we should charge the parents. Right, like, yep. Like yeah. I'm telling you, it begins, yeah. and so it begins, and like you just need somebody to actually enforce the law to have the guts yeah. to do it and say this isn't a crime. They're bad people. They're bad parents. They're not going to get the mother of the year award. But there are, th there are three thousand right. prosecutors in this country, Scott. One for every county. That's three thousand people 
who are looking at this and possibly trying to win their own elections, trying to prove they're tough on crime, trying to make a name for themselves, trying to, trying to, trying to. It's like you just gave them a new tool, man, and you don't think that someone out there might potentially bend this, move this maybe further than you intended? You don't see this getting out of control? You're all a bunch of idiots. (laughs) Yep, yep. Like I said, as long as everybody feels better, I guess, that's all that really matters. Um, I miss talking to you, Scott. You're great. Yeah, no, it's been a while. I mean, you know, during COVID, everybody kind of, Got to talk and you know do stuff and I miss, I miss that I miss the I, I tell you we'll have to do it again uh, because I'm telling you it has just been uh, God I've been swamped swamped I you know during COVID I think I did three trials and it's just been trial after trial after trial and the problem is I've just been getting my butt kicked lately um, you know and it's like I want to you know Vanna uh, I'd like to buy a good fact for 100 please mm. uh, just haven't had any and. Uh, the, the one that I just did for four weeks, you never, you know, it's never good when they say it's in the newspaper. Prosecutors anticipate historic human trafficking sentence oh, following conviction, you know, and they, they go through and they say what a horrible client, you know, my, my client was a horrible person. And, um, you well, know, to be fair, ask- human traffickers are pretty bad people. So we'll they'll be asking for 472 years uh in 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 the sentencing and i get it human trafficking when you're buying and selling people human trafficking i get that you want to talk about real human trafficking how about all the people that come across the border and they have to pay the coyotes and they get to their town and you know they're expected to start working it off by delivering drugs or committing crime you can't say things like that scott you're racist coyotes no hey I'm, i'm telling you I got a couple of federal cases going on right now. I know you're right. Exactly. Right. Fact. Exact same facts. I swear. And nobody talk. I'm, I'm like, I'm asking the United States attorney, why are you not prosecuting these people for human trafficking? I mean, this is the definition of it, right? That and like selling, uh, you know, s- small, small children. I mean, it's just, uh, but it's what's the narrative of the day. What are we going to go with today? The flavor of the month. That's what they use it for. Yeah, that's annoying. So, A Rights, I appreciate you joining us this evening. Um, congratulations on your channel. I know you're going well, your move. And um, I got to do a little uh, appointment in the morning, but I'll be in tomorrow. Maybe we can uh, touch base after uh, the, the Valo case and uh, touch base with each other. If you want to co stream with me or if you want to be on camera for some of this uh, Daybell thing, you're more than welcome to. I will read to you. Would you like me to read some of the words to you? Did you did you read their uh, sexting messages to each other? Did you read that? Uh, yeah, four pages part, with the, part with the, with, the, with the loin fire. Did you, yes. Did you did you enjoy the loin fire, Scott? You know, I've heard better reading, but you know, it was pretty pretty. You know, it was almost pretty geographic, so to speak. What it could have been, mm-hmm. I guess. I mean, I guess those good Mormon values were you know flowing on through. I mean, if you're gonna allegedly kill your wife to be with your mistress, uh, at least keep it G rated until you're married, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's just going to get weird. The whole thing's been weird from the beginning, but I'm not going to lie. I'm, I'm kind of be happy that it's over. All right. Well, it's nice talking with you. Thanks for having me on. All right. We'll be in touch. Thanks everybody. Uncivil law. Check him out. All right. Thank you. Have a good night. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that was, you know, we kind of did that um, uh, kind of on a, a, when we saw Uncivil Law, we had uh, tuned in and um, last week, I think we did, and he, he uh, wasn't able to to join us. So I thought, eh, what the heck, it's been a while since we talked. Uh, we met him uh, when we were doing, uh, uh, during the COVID stuff, Rakita Law as well. And uh, so we chatted and his, he was getting a, his channel going and uh, was going to go in all time, full time on that. So that's, uh, that's, that's great for him. So uh, appreciate it. He was all, you know, appellate attorneys, always smart guys, always smart guys. Like, unlike us trial attorneys that, you know, all we can do is talk for a living. They actually have to be able to write it and put it down uh, on paper and, um, you know, make it sound, make it sound competent. Whereas we, we can just, you know, we can just wing it. We can just wing it if we have to. So, all right. We went over a little bit, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank everybody for joining us. We're going to take a quick break. 
And then we're going to do our Patreon show. If you haven't become a Patreon, now would be the time to do so. And you get some free cool stuff if you become a Patreon member. Plus, you get an hour show or a show to yourself, depending on how many people join us and how long you want to talk. Uh, but you can call in as well, and we'll talk about anything that you want to talk about. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.